our last video ended kind of abruptly as we were just talking about how truth cannot contradict truth. Just to recap, remember we were talking about Aristotle's dialectic, which was this method of resolving the contradictions that seem to show up in the way things appear to us. And recall that appearances included both um, our own personal experiences of a thing, our own experience, but then also the opinions that arise from other people's experiences and we receive from other people as their opinions. And so um, we, we, we experience the world in part through the, the other opinions we hear about people. If someone tells me this restaurant is great, you should go there, already the world is showing up to me in that expression of your opinion. And Aristotle has this key idea that truth can't contradict truth. And that he would say that, that there's always some reason that someone would have some particular opinion. And that's ultimately what Socrates is after when he's saying that we need to take opinion seriously, right? Um, and so that that and, and the core idea about any particular opinion is that uh, all opinions um, contain opinions contain uh, contain at least partial truth at least partial truth. What do I mean? They contain at least partial truth, right? That there's always something true about them. There's always something true um, about the opinion. That, that made it that person's opinion. And it's that there was some ultimately some real experience, right? There was some real um, experience that a person had that led them to have that opinion. And so we want to trace things back to the reality of the specific experiences that led to that opinion and that at least it led to some partial truth about the thing that we're trying to know and understand, right? And, 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 and part of the idea is that when someone expresses an opinion, even opinions that we think are strange, um, the opinion shows that that, that, that in some ways that, that there's something about the thing that can show up the way that it appeared in that person's opinion or in that person's experience, right? And so we ask ourselves, what about the thing, what about a thing makes it appear the way, the way, you know, someone describes? So, um, you know, when someone talks about a restaurant that they really like, you might wonder, why is it that it appears that way to them? What's the re the truth about the thing that shows up and causes it to appear that way, right? Or if we think of, uh, we even mentioned this sort of phrase before, if someone says ignorance is bliss, ignorance is bliss, right? If someone says that, the reason that they would say that, and the reason it almost becomes a cliched statement is because there must be something true about it. The real question, I mean, is happiness ignorance? Right? And we'll talk about happiness quite literally. Is happiness is ignorance. Is that the case? That the only way to be happy is to be ignorant? Um, I would say that's that's false. Right? Um, that can't possibly be the case. That happiness is truly ignorance. But yet there's something true about this. And what's what would lead someone to say this? Well, sometimes um, the kinds of things that we would know about the the state of the world or the state of our relationships or things like that might actually cause us to be less happy in those in those times. And that. Um, in that sense that it would be better that we didn't even know, at least from our personal perspective, at least in the moment, that's the way it seems to us, right? And so there is a reason that we might say something like this. It's not, so it doesn't, when we say, when Aristotle says that this is a fact, it's a fact that someone says it, but it's not necessarily a fact that it's literally true in its completeness, it's partially true. There's some reason why someone would legitimately say and think this, even if this in general is not a true statement. Maybe it's not true that ignorance truly is bliss in its fullness, but there was a good reason why someone would utter that and have it um, express something true about their particular experience in this instance. And Aristotle wants to take this very seriously. Now, if, we, if we're going to take experiences and opinions so seriously as being something that we need to dialectically examine in order to, to get to the truth of things, to get to real definitions, right? And we're going to take them so seriously, especially the opinions of the common and the wise. This means that you need to actually have some experience, right? In order to be able to do dialectic, right? And especially the dialectic that Aristotle is going to try to do when it comes to ethics, because that's what this, uh, this whole section of our course is really going to be about, ethics. And ethics has to do with what we do, um, or rather what I should do, right? When I ask myself the question, um, you know, what, what should I do right now in this moment, even right now as we sit here in the in the stages of being locked in our houses, a lot of us um, struggling and, and worrying about the way life's going to be, we're asking ourselves, what should we do, right? Um, 
this is this ethical question. Aristotle would say that if we're going to think, uh, be able to think well about ethics, we need to have experience. Uh, that in order to have a dialectic where we begin with these common uh, views and the views of the wise, and we examine the reasons that people would have them, you have to be familiar with them, right? So um, the, the the idea is that children, right? Children um, do not study ethics. Do not uh, study ethics per se. Um, a child will be taught what's right and what's wrong, and they'll. Um, and, and Aristotle will later talk about how children um, they'll be instructed, right? And a lot of their instruction is going to be a kind of habituation, um, and we'll talk about what habituation is. But it's it's about um, giving people the right, telling people the right principles, and helping them develop the right habits so that they can um, become good kind of people. But but primarily, children aren't going to sit here and raise questions about the very principles of, the, of right and wrong and things like this. Uh, children can't. Why? Fundamentally, Aristotle will say they can't because they lack experience, right? They can't address um, the common views and the, and the views of the wise and try to get to why. They need to know that certain things are true and that's how they should act and they need to become the kind of person who would who would act according to the knowledge that their parents teach them to be the right thing right and so uh, when aristotle talks about this let's read a quick text where he talks about how dialectic requires experience so there's my phone case right um so here we're actually back into book one, which is now technically one of the readings for this particular week. But we're looking at book one, um, chapter three. Um, and if you're working out of the third edition of Irwin, it's only page three. Right? So here we see a couple of important things. First, Aristotle says, furthermore, each person judges rightly what he knows. Right? Okay, what you know. And, a good, and is a good judge about that. Hence, the good judge in a given area is the person educated in that area. Now, you need to have some type of education. And education is uh, ultimately, at the very least, it's a familiarity. Fili familiarity. Does that say familiarity? Familiarity. Whatever. Familiarity. Let me see if I can write it one more time. Familiarity. Right? With views. Right? At the very least, education is a familiarity with many of the different views, especially if we're going to start getting into ethics and a lot of the different choices that people make and in in, in what they do with their lives. So first of all, someone's going to be educated. And this education, again, doesn't necessarily mean uh, like a, a ridiculous amount of school education. It's just a familiarity with things, right? And someone would be an unqualifiedly good judge in the person who's educated in every area. That's great. But let's dig into deep, uh, deeperness when he talks about youth. This is why a youth is not suitable st student of political science. And one thing to point out whenever Aristotle is talking about political science here, he's also talking more specifically about ethics. Because remember, ethics has to do with what I should do as a person, but politics has to do with what we should do as a community. And so um, interestingly enough, Aristotle uses the phrase po politics in book one, um, almost synonymously with ethics, at least that's the way that we'll treat it for our course. But anyway, he says, a youth is not suitable student of political science for he lacks experience in the actions of life, right? The only way that you could do ethics well is if you've actually lived your life, right? And and it says these the, the actions of life are the subject and premises of our arguments, right? One thing to say as a side, it's an interesting thing that um, sort of student geniuses tend to not be good at things like ethics so much, but they tend to be good at things like, say, mathematics, you know, or physics and stuff like that. Um, why would math be something that like a student genius would be good at? Well, in part, it requires almost no experience. It requires almost no experience, right? Um, it's, it's, it's the most general, it's extremely general and universal. Um, it's also incredibly, uh, it's incredibly theoretical, right? And we'll make a distinction between what's theoretical and what's practical later on, but it's something that you can examine through pure reason. So student geniuses don't tend to go into politics, but they'll go into some of the sciences um, or and mathematics and those pure kind of things. Um, and so you need, though, if you're going to be a good politician or if you're going to just be a good human who's studying ethics, you need to have experience in life's actions because this is what everything's about. And then Aristotle continues. He says, moreover, since he tends to follow his feelings, and 
His study will be futile and useless since the goal is action, not knowledge. The purpose of this text in us studying ethics is not to just know more, but to be able to do, to become the kind of person and to act out on our understanding. And that's an interesting thing. When Aristotle looks at children, he realizes they don't necessarily listen to arguments because they tend to follow their feelings, right? And so in part, Sometimes the, to get a child to do what you want them to do, or even as a teacher and to try to encourage your students to do as you want, you need to have them become almost emotionally invested in making sure that they do the right thing, right? Sometimes I find that students will do the right thing for me, not necessarily because they um, their mind tells them to, because they uh, they have some allegiance to me and they're... they're um, they don't want to let me down. They don't want to make me to feel bad. That's the same reason why kids might not go against their parents or maybe choose to go with their, <laughs> against their parents because they're acting on their feelings, not necessarily on their reason. And so, and there Aristotle continues, though, the interesting thing that is not only children who act this way, only on their feelings. He says, it does not matter whether he is young in years or or immature in character, right? So it's not just about being young in years, it's also about just being immature as a kind of person. You could see people who are adults who act just as immaturely as children, acting on feelings and not reason. It says, since the deficiency does not depend on age, but results on following his feelings in his life and in a given pursuit. For an immature person like an incontinent gets no benefit from his knowledge. Now, Aristotle does mean very specifically that you need to have experience with life. But in order to actually then take that knowledge and examine it in terms of the truth of ethics and then to have that truth actually bear out in your life to make you um, a, a good person, you need to not only have that experience, but you have to have the character to act on that. And that's going to be fundamental when we start to talk later on in, um, in next week in our course about the nature of virtue. And... Um, even in the next set of virtues, you'll see it'll sort of culminate in talking about how the, the best life that we can live is ultimately a life of virtue. And it's going to involve uh, certainly having a certain kind of understanding, which will in part come from experience and knowledge, but also to having a certain kind of character to act on that knowledge. So um, Aristotle's dialectical method, again, we'll, we'll see it play out primarily within the ethics here. And we'll, um, this week we'll be digging into the, the concept of the best kind of life, which we'll, we'll see has something to do with happiness. Um, and then we'll examine virtue more specifically. Um, and then we'll come back to how uh, virtue uh, is connected to happiness. And we'll contrast Aristotle to some other modern philosophers who talk about similar kinds of things like Kant and Mill in uh, the third week of, of studying Aristotle. So I hope this is helpful. Have a beautiful day. And I'll catch up with you soon. Uh, have a beautiful day. I think I said that. Giddy up.